Hello and welcome to this talk on robotic sailing. My name is Colin Serze and for many years I've worked on robotic sailing boats at Aberystwyth University in the Intelligent Robotics Group. So you might be wondering why we'd like to have um, robotic sailing boats and the main reason for them is not to just sail people for pleasure but to um, do what we call in robotics the three Ds, tasks that are dull, dirty or dangerous. And this might mean things like oceanographic sensing, where we send a robot out into the sea to measure something like the temperature or the salinity or the depth of the water for a very long period of time, or in places where it's very difficult to send um, people to. From a robotics research point of view, we also um, use these kind of robots for research into how we can get robots to perform on their own for long term because unlike most robots there's no one there to press a reset switch if something goes wrong or to turn it on and off again the robot's got to be very very independent we've been building these robots in Aberystwyth for many years and our first one was called Aru the autonomous robot for ocean observation which we built in 2004 and just show you a short video of that robot um, the sail on it is a wing sail instead of a traditional fabric sail because these are um, more resilient, um, harder to break and um, they work very well in very light winds as well because they don't um, lose their shape as the wind drops. And this one is actually made out of a piece of aluminium from an old London bus. Now this boat had some very simple sensors. On top of the sail is a wind vane to measure which way the wind is coming from so it knows how to set its sail and there is a compass to tell it which way it is pointing. There actually isn't any kind of GPS navigation in there so all it can do is sail on a fixed um, compass heading and what it's done in this video is it sailed out for a minute or two um, on a given heading and then it flips around and sails itself back to the shore. And it should flip around any minute. Actually, I think it's heading back there because I see the red bit at the front and that's the front of the boat. Now, after the success of that boat, we um, got some money to build a much bigger, better boat. And this boat was called Beagle B, named after the, the Beagle 2 Mars probe that was going on at the same time. And this is a three and a half meter long disabled sailor's hull that's been adapted for um, robotic sailing. So normally the sailor would sit right down in the middle of the hull facing forwards and they would control the traditional sail. But here we've changed it for another wing sail. This time it's made of carbon fiber because aluminium would be too heavy on a boat this size. And we've got a more elaborate sensor setup. So on top of the mast is an ultrasonic wind sensor that can sense the wind direction without any moving parts. It's also very, very good at picking up um, very light winds. There's a GPS on the deck for knowing where it is in the world. A very good magnetic compass. Um, there's a satellite modem as well, so we can transmit data from it and receive messages anywhere in the world as well. And we also have a water quality monitoring device that can be put in it so it can actually give us some measurements about um, the sea that it's sailing through. So the device for measuring the, the water quality is known as a, a sonde. This is a device that measures um, five different parameters. So it can measure how much oxygen is dissolved in the water, how much chlorophyll from um, plant life there is in the water, the total amount of, sort of dissolved solids are how clear the water looks, the temperature of the water and the amount of salt or its salinity. And first we tried using a pump, which is this little red thing here, to pump water into the, the chamber, which is at the end here that does all the sensing. We found that didn't work as well as we'd hoped, so in the end we just dragged this behind the boat. And the map on the right shows us dragging it around um, Cardiff Bay, where we measured the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water. We then got involved in a competition to build um, boats to race across the Atlantic called the Microtransat Challenge and we built a much more traditional boat for that. This is a boat based on a top of Taz dinghy that we called Pinta named after one of um, Columbus's ships that crossed the Atlantic and here in this video it's sailing out a competition we had in Austria on a big lake. Now this uses a modified tiller pilot to steer itself so this is something you'd use as an autopilot on a big boat and it's the, the black arm at the back 
And apart from that, the electronics are pretty much the same as what we used in Beagle B, as we'd already shown them to work fairly well. Um, it did gain some solar panels later on, which aren't shown in this video, but you'll see those on the next um, video. So the route we were going to take to get across the Atlantic was going to take us from the west coast of Ireland, down south past Portugal, past Madeira, the Canary Islands, down to the Cape Verde Islands, and then across to um, Martinique and St Lucia in the Caribbean. And the reason we have to go this way is this is the way the prevailing winds go. Going through the middle, you get a big calm in the middle where you don't get much wind. Now we also have people who go the other way around and start from North America and come across to um, Europe. Most of them go from Newfoundland and Canada, which is the closest place they can go from, to Ireland. And although it's a shorter distance, the weather tends to be a lot worse on that route and you can get icebergs a lot of the year. Um, the Titanic sank somewhere around here, I think, um, from an iceberg that it hit. And here is a video of us launching Pinta in 2010 off the west coast of Ireland. It was a very rough day, as you'll see from the video. Um, we all felt quite seasick, but the robot was quite happy to sail in these kind of conditions. It's not the sort of day that you would ever have taken out a boat that size on your own um, voluntarily. So the route that Pinta took, we started on this left-hand side, um, this shows more detail, from Valentia Island, and we sailed southwest. We were aiming for this waypoint over here, marked waypoint one, um, but things didn't quite go according to plan because there's a very strong storm system that started coming in, and we were hoping to get launched ahead of it, but didn't quite get there in time. So we never quite made it up to waypoint one, and then we think something broke and the boat started heading south again. And we got a message here that the system inside had rebooted itself, and we think that might have been water getting into the electronics box. And it kept going south, and then it got to down here, and um, after 49 hours of sailing, we got the last message from the satellite tracking system. But we had a backup tracker that worked completely on its own, um, running off its own battery, and that kept going for another two weeks. And that then showed that we turned around and headed north, and the boat sailed quite nicely to begin with and then started to slow down and go around in a lot more circles and we think at that point the sail probably got um, destroyed and eventually it just stopped sending us messages and we never found it unfortunately. But since then there have been 31 attempts to do the microtransat and one of them has been successful and that's this um, purple one here called SB Met from a company based in Norway and they sailed from Newfoundland in Canada all the way to Ireland and they actually then sailed it up around the top coast of Scotland and over to Bergen in Norway. But once they'd hit this point they were considered to have um, completed the race. Now this light pink one called Open Transat sailed um, last year and actually made it all the way to Ireland but missed its um, target point that it had told us it was going to hit before it set off. And when it got to Ireland they didn't manage to recover it and no one's seen it since, apart from a bit of its sail washed up in a beach somewhere in northern France over here. Um, so unfortunately that one doesn't count as having completed the competition. Now we've built several big boats um, by this point and found that they weren't always the easiest things to handle. You often needed three people to get them in the water and you needed the big boat to tow them around, which meant you needed a good whole day to work on them and good weather and for doing some of the robotics experiments on how we to deal with um, having robots out there for a long term that actually meant it was quite slow to get any experiments done. So we built some smaller boats that we called the MOOPs, the Miniature Ocean Observation Platforms and these are only 75 centimeters long. They're designed for um, one person to be able to handle them easily. You can fit several of them in the back of a car and we built quite a few of these so they're quite cheap to build as well. Um, the whole deck comes off in one piece, so you've got access to everything inside. Um, There's one big compartment, which meant it was quite easy to get your hands in and fix anything as well when anything goes wrong, whereas some of the others had compartments inside that made it quite hard to um, get to anywhere. And we built quite a few different types of these. Some had one sail, some had two. Most of them had wing sails still. Um, a couple of them had fabric sails. We also tried one without a rudder on it, using the sails to um, steer instead. The one you're seeing here in the video has two sails, which we found um, probably worked the best. 
because the sails can act to do some steering by um, setting them differently, but we can also use the rudder for steering as well, and that um, we found improved both the speed and the um, accuracy at which they could sail. Now one problem with that design was it was quite slow and we've been to quite a few international competitions where we sail boats on um, short distance courses and we are not professional boat designers, we are computer scientists and one of the people at one of these was um, a naval architect who knows how to design boats properly from the US Naval Academy and he somewhat took pity on us for having designed this rather slow MOOP design but like some of its other features like how small it was and how easy to transport so he designed what's called the Maxi Moop, which is a 1.3 meter hull based on very loosely the same ideas. And they've built quite a few of these and we've built a couple as well. So then used by the Abersailbot student sailing team, who you'll hear from later on. Um, this blue one down here is one of the US Naval Academy's ones that they um, are testing in a swimming pool there, but they later launched into the Atlantic and tried to sail it in the microtransat. And it went quite well until a fishing boat caught it, but they did, I think, four or five hundred miles with a boat that's only um, 1.3 metres long. We then diverted into building motorboats after um, somebody from our geography department asked us if we could build them a boat to help survey um, a glacier in Greenland. So they took this boat we called Minty out to Greenland on a, a yacht that sailed from Aberystwyth and you can see it there on the deck upside down so that the silver front is a bit that's covered in steel to protect it from the ice and the back is um, wooden but that should get less exposed to the ice and in the middle underneath there is a sonar to map what is going on on the seabed underneath it and to the sides and then on top it can take a 3D laser scanner to map what is happening above the water. And the plan is that it would sail along in front of the glacier where ice is constantly falling off and it's quite dangerous for people to be there because some of these lumps of ice are very big and create large waves. And it would produce a three-dimensional map of what was above and below the water. And then it would do it again a few days later and they could work out how much ice had fallen off the glacier because they don't really know how quickly the glacier is moving and how much ice it's losing. And it's obviously very dangerous for um, humans to make that kind of journey because some of these icebergs are very big. I'll just show you a bit of the video. This is the um, time lapse of the glacier and you can see here these pools forming in the water from bits of ice coming off. Now here we don't see any large pieces come off but sometimes um, quite large chunks like this whole headland would come off and form giant icebergs that create um, very big waves and a big hazard for anyone um, trying to sail in front of it. Now we also took this boat we called Minty on a few missions in the UK. Um, so here it is sailing on Balla Lake up in North Wales. We also took it to a couple of missions in Scotland and one down in Pembrokeshire to look at a um, shipwreck. So here we haven't got the laser scanner on it, we've just got the sonar so it's doing a survey of the um, lake bed underneath it. And for this it has to sail up and down in a grid pattern um, which actually takes a very very long time as you're just repeating the same bit um, a few meters separation each time you do it. And on board here we've also got two of these these white sticks, a long range Wi-Fi so we can always be connected to the computers on it and the white domes are um, GPS antennas that give us a very high accuracy GPS that lets us know where we are within a few centimeters. And this is the view from the camera that's on the front of the boat and we get a live view back on shore of this so we can make sure that there's nothing in our way and here we were a bit concerned about this yacht that was sailing around us that they um, might not keep out of our way enough and we can always take remote control of it um, over the radio. And then back in our mission control this is the screen we see with showing where the boat is and what its status is and the video feed from it. And we also get the view from the sonar software showing us what that's currently seeing under the water. So we have a depth map here which is colour highlighting the, the different depths of water. This up here is showing us how straight we're going because it's quite important when you're doing surveys to go in a straight line. And we also need to know how much the boat's rolling and pitching because um, the sonar needs to work out where when it sends out a ping that point is actually bouncing off. So the boat's rolled over a little bit that changes where that ping will hit on the seabed um, and that's also why we need the very high accuracy GPS to work out where we were and then we can work out exactly where it was that that ping um, bounced off. Now 
We then entered a um, competition run by the, the National Oceanography Centre to build a boat that was designed to go at very high speeds to a location and then sit there for a short while and um, or a long while sorry, and do some measurements such as doing some oceanography measurements and then to drive back at quite high speed. So for this we built a hybrid boat that had both um, sails and a motor and the idea was this one is that it could travel at up to a speed of about six knots under its motor and about three or four um, under the sails and that it could also raise and lower the sails itself and raise and lower its keel so it bring the keel up when it was traveling um, under motor and typically YouTube is not wanting to play this video for me it is now um, starting to sail with a little bit of assistance from the motor so it can always do both And I'll show them the next video, and this is it motoring on its own with the sails down off um, Aberystwyth North Beach. Now the plan with this was if we'd won the um, competition, which unfortunately we didn't, we would have built a much bigger version of it that would have had a diesel generator, solar panels and a wind turbine on it. So it could collect um, electricity from the wind and the sun, or it could turn on its diesel generator if it didn't have enough wind and sun to recharge its batteries and the batteries would then run the motor which would allow it to go at um, high speed. So if it spent say a couple of weeks um, on station just sailing around doing some measurements it would hopefully gain enough electricity in that time to do a high speed run back if it had run out of diesel already. Now we're not concentrating so much on building new boats as we've got lots of boats, but instead we're looking at doing some um, computer vision and machine learning to pick up obstacles that these boats might see. Because right now we haven't had any automatic obstacle avoidance on these boats because it's been quite um, expensive both in terms of the, the amount of electricity needed and the um, power of the computers needed to do this. But what we started doing is training up a um, machine learning technique called a neural network with lots and lots of example images taken from all the video we've got from our boats of what different obstacles at sea look like and then we can use that to learn um, what we're seeing and just about be able to work out where they are and avoid them. Now this will also be coupled with data from um, radars or radio transponders. We won't just use the camera because obviously it's not always um, good conditions to see but that's just like the ex um, experience of a human sailor at sea. So now I'm going to pass over to um, Daria from Abba Sailbot to talk about the um, boats that the students have built and raced.